In this lecture, we are going to cover um, energy methods and the principle of virtual work. So we start with the principle of virtual work. And we do that for, to start with, for a point mass. And we do it only for statics, of course. And then generalization to dynamics is uh, straightforward. But we don't need to bother about it in our course, since it will just concentrate on statics. So you have the point particle. And if it is in equilibrium, then Newton's law would say that the net force acting on the particle should be a zero vector. So this is a statement that has to apply to, to the forces themselves. But then, if you have a force vector, which is zero, it's a zero vector, then a zero force will do zero work on any possible displacement. So if we imagine that this particle moved from its equilibrium position a little bit in all directions, then the work done by the forces, if they are in equilibrium, on any small displacement from the equilibrium position, will be equal to zero. So the small displacement from the equilibrium position that we talk about is called a virtual displacement. And that virtual displacement is not real. It is not a displacement that actually occurs. It is just imagine that the particle might be displaced a little bit from equilibrium. And by little bit here, we mean infinitesimally small, so that we can always neglect higher order terms in delta u. And then we take the work done by the actual forces acting on the particle on that virtual displacement vector, and this is what we call virtual work. And this is nothing other than, and this is a dot product. Of course, if you want to write it in matrix notation, would like this as F transpose delta U. So if the particle is in equilibrium in a given position, then automatically F is zero, this is the definition of equilibrium, then it goes without saying that the virtual work will be zero. On the other hand, let us assume that the virtual work is zero for our arbitrary choice of delta u. So we start from F transpose delta u equals zero for arbitrary delta u, not for a particular selection of the virtual displacement, but for arbitrary virtual displacement. Then from that, we can easily show that F is zero. So equilibrium is satisfied. How do we do that? The easiest thing to do is we can select delta u to be in the direction 1, 0, 0, in which case this will give us that fx equals 0. This corresponds to delta u equals a small amount 0, 0. Yeah? 
And again, we can choose delta u to be in the direction of the y-axis and then the z-axis and then the work done, equating the work done to be zero will give us the three components fx equals zero, fy equals zero, fz equals zero. So this already tells us that it is necessary and sufficient for the virtual work done by the forces on the body to be zero in order for equilibrium to be satisfied. So if the virtual work on arbitrary virtual displacement is zero, then equilibrium satisfied. If equilibrium is satisfied, then the virtual work done on arbitrary virtual displacements will be zero. The other thing we learn from this very simple example is that if you want to find force equilibrium in x direction, you allow the body small virtual displacements in x direction, and this will give you forces, sigma forces in x equals zero. If you want to find the sum of forces, the equation of equilibrium in y uh, direction, sigma force in y equals zero, you allow the body to have a virtual displacement in the direction of y, and so forth and so on. So essentially, for each virtual displacement choice, we satisfy equilibrium in a given direction. If we allow ourselves all possible choices of virtual displacement, then we, we're sure that equilibrium satisfies in all possible directions, and as such, the body is in, is in equilibrium. So this is the principle of virtual work for single particle. Now we move on to what happens for a collection of particles. So multiple particles. There are two cases to um, consider here. One case is that when these particles are not connected to each other, and this is just trivial because the virtual work, the total virtual work would be the sum of the virtual work on the first particle plus the second particle. And then you will equate this to zero. It's very simple. And then this will give you equations of equilibrium for both, for both the first and second particles because now your virtual displacements are no longer uh, they no longer have three components. There will be three virtual displacements corresponding to the first particle and three virtual displacements corresponding to the second particle. So the case of multiple particles, when they are not connected in any special way, is just straightforward summation. What is more interesting is the case where there are constraints between these two, two particles or more. So the simplest thing we can imagine is assume we have two particles and they are connected by a massless rigid rod that will not allow the distance between these two particles to change. So let us now isolate the body into individual particles because this is how we can use Newton's laws because we apply for particles, we don't apply for whole bodies. So this would give us a particle here. Let's call him number one and another particle here, number two. But since these two are co constrained to remain at the same distance, there has to be some force, internal force acting on, on both bodies in order to maintain the distance between the two. And this internal force should satisfy Newton's third law of action and reaction, being equal and opposite in direction. So if the force the reaction force on this guy is in this direction, 
the reaction force here will be in the same magnitude, exactly opposite direction. So let us call this reaction force R. And if this vector is R, this vector is minus R. And there will be a net force acting on particle 1, net external force. We will call this F1. And some net external force acting on body number 2 or particle number 2. And let us call this F2. OK. So what do we know now as far as equilibrium is concerned? We do know that F1 plus R equals 0. And in the virtual work, we will find that F1 transpose delta U1, where delta U1 are virtual displacements of the first particle, plus R transpose delta U1 will equal 0. OK? All right, very good. OK, now we can move to the virtual work, total virtual work done on particle 2. It will be very similar. It will look like F2 transpose delta U2 minus R transpose delta U2, which will also be equal to 0. Of course, this is not a vector. It's a scalar. This is very short work. All right. So let us add in order to find the total virtual work, which is, of course, equal to zero if the equilibrium is satisfied. So we end up with total virtual work equals F1 transpose delta U1. So this is external force acting on body one, then external force acting on the second particle, and then the reaction terms can be written as R transpose times delta U1 minus delta U2. And this will have to be equal to zero for equilibrium to occur. So what you can easily see here is that the internal reaction force actually depends on the relative motion of the two particles, which makes sense because it is trying to prevent the relative moment, the relative movement of these two particles. Okay. So now let us think about the two particles when they are in such a horizontal position. Is it true that the force R would be in a general position as I drew it, or would be a particular direction that R should assume? Think about it this way. What are the possible movements, possible virtual movements of particles 1 and 2? So let us assume that this is the x-axis, and this is the y-axis, and again, Displacement component in X is U, and displacement component in Y is V. We will see here that the possible virtual motions of the body are U1 and V1, delta U1 and delta V1, which are the virtual displacements of the first body, and delta U2 and delta V2. But since the distance between 1 and 2 has to remain fixed, we do know that delta U1 will have to be equal to delta U2. It is not up to us to um, to choose them independently, because otherwise, the distance between these two bodies will change. So if you look here, 
you will find that if this is your delta u1 as a vector, delta u2 as a vector. So you will see from here that the difference will have to be equal to zero and delta v1 minus delta v2 because of the constraint. So when we multiply our transpose by this, and this is something in mechanics, it's an axiom about constraint forces, that constraint forces are always such that they don't do any work on vertical displacement that honor the constraint. And from here, we'll see that this means that R cannot be just any old thing. It will be some scalar R here and a zero here, so that when we take the dot product, it will always be zero. So if you have two bodies which are really connected such that the distance between them cannot change, the reaction cannot just pick any direction. It will be in the direction of the line connecting these two particles. So it will always be. And this is very important in mechanics that the basic assumption is if something is preventing displacement in a certain direction, you need a force only in the same direction along which the displacement is prevented. You don't need any force which is perpendicular to that. So if you have a constraint, then the work done by the constraint on virtual displacement that honor the constraint, that satisfy the constraint, will be zero. And as such, this term here, the underlying term, is always zero if our reactions satisfy this condition. And as such, we can work with only the non-zero terms. Someone would say, but wait a second. This is just the same expression we would have had, we would have had, if we didn't consider the constraint at all. So this is as if we're treating the two bodies as independent and not connected. Well, the trick here is that if the two bodies were completely disconnected, we would have ended up with four independent components of our virtual displacement because delta u1, delta v1, delta u2, delta v2, all these would be independent components, so we would have ended up with four equations of equilibrium. But for this constraint system, in order to satisfy the constraint, which we need to if we are going to assume that the reaction term is zero, then you have only three independent vertical displacements, delta u1, delta v1, and delta v2, because delta u2 will have to be equal to delta u1 if the distance between the two particles will remain the same after virtual displacement as before the virtual displacement. So fundamentally, the principle of virtual work states that the work done the virtual work done, let us say, by forces, yeah, on the body, on any virtual 
and n here meaning arbitrary displacements satisfying constraints is zero. And this condition, this principle of virtual work, is equivalent to Newton law, which is essentially sigma forces equal zero on every particle in the sea. Yeah? The nice thing about about virtual work is that it takes constraints, constraint forces, reactions, it takes them completely out of the picture, and then all what we need to worry about is geometry. So we need to find the set of displacements which are compatible with the constraints. That's it. Once we have these, then we set the virtual work done by the applied forces on the body on these displacements to zero, and we end up with the equations of equilibrium without having to worry about the reaction forces anymore. So now we need to see how to formulate the principle of virtual work for deformable body. So, and this is the main, to main topic, of course, because in structure, we don't work with rigid bodies, we work with deformable bodies. So, in order to do that, we take a deformable body, yeah, and we calculate the total work done by the forces acting on the body. So, as simple as that. So, there will be some external loading applied on the surface of the body there will be certain areas where displacement is prevented and there will be some body forces acting inside the volume of the body. And again, we will have B to be our body force per unit volume And the loading on the surface will be represented by the traction vector. These are surface tractions. What we know from our previous lecture on stresses is that the surface tractions are given by stress dot normal vector m. Okay, so now let us see how to calculate the work done. We need to calculate the work done in two steps. Yeah, one of them is first we calculate the work done by the body forces, then we calculate the virtual work done by the surface fractions, we add them, we get the total virtual work done. So let us think about the surface fractions. If you take a small area on the surface, the force acting on that area is going to be sigma m dot times the area. And if the displacement vector at that, in, in the center of this area is zero, 
Then work done will be F transpose U, delta U, or delta U transpose F, because it's a scalar, it doesn't matter which one we transpose. So you can write this as delta U transpose and then you integrate over the boundary of the body. That's very simple. And this would be the virtual work done by the surface traction. Of course, we don't know the surface tractions on this area here where so this area here where the displacement is prevented we don't know the surface traction there will be unknown reactions at the at that point but virtual virtual displacement at in this region are zero because we said that we are only interested in virtual displacements which are compatible with the constraint so Again, the contribution from this part to the virtual work will be zero, and we don't have to worry about it. So essentially, we can write this integral to be an integral over the complete surface of the body with the understanding that delta u itself, where the displacements are prescribed, will be equal to zero in order to be consistent with the constraint. The second term will be the work done by the body forces. And body force, so you take a small volume here inside the body, and then the net force acting on that is D, dV, and then you multiply that by the displacement of that particle, which is delta U transpose D, dV, and you integrate over the whole body. And this is the total virtual work, and you can set this to zero. So this is the principle of virtual work for the form of body. Of course, we would really like to simplify this a little bit more. Yeah? So how are we going to do this? Exactly the same as we have done when we were trying to find the equilibrium condition. We had two terms, a term from tractions, which involved a surface integral, and a term from body forces, which involved a volume integral. So what we do is we convert the surface integral into a uh, into a uh, volume integral using the divergence theorem. And this is going to be, um, yeah, slightly um, difficult because there are tensors and vectors, but we can think about this in the following way. Sigma is already a asymmetric tensor. So we can write the integrand here as sigma times delta u transpose times n the area. Yes. And this would mean that to apply the divergence theorem, we need to apply it to the, this vector here, which is sigma times delta u. So we can write this as integration now over the body, the divergence of sigma times delta u. This is a vector, yeah? So the divergence of a vector is a scalar. So we are fine d volume plus integral delta u transpose d, d volume equals zero. 